Welcome. It's always great to see the hall so, um, so full. I think there are spaces downstairs as well for those of you who are um, sort of uh, sitting on the uh, sidelines. And there are a couple of empty seats down here uh, if you want to sit more deeply inside. Nobody's moving. I can see this. That's fine. I'd like to welcome you all to the uh, 2009 uh, Werner Seligman Lecture. Uh, this lecture is uh, particularly significant for the School of Architecture, and it remembers uh, Werner Seligman's work as an educator and an architect. As the seventh dean of the School of Architecture, his pedagogy is legendary, as is his commitment to the school. I'd like to recognize Jean Seligman, who is up front and who's with us tonight, and thank her for continued interest and support of the school. When thinking about the selection of the architect for this annual event, which has included Peter Eisenman, Todd Williams, Billy Chen, Weissman Freddy, Max Goggin, Craig Dykers, we search for work that expands on this tradition of spatial innovation in architecture. And this year, it's a delight for us to have Greg Pascarelli. Uh, his talk is called Out of Practice, which I like. It's a double entendre. Um, one way it means um, rusty, uh, which he clearly isn't. You'll see this when he's up on stage. Um, but it also can be read as derived from, uh, as in out of necessity, which seems more fitting. The firm's shop gleans maximum effect with minimal means, achieving a material and formal richness derived from the strengths or more often the challenges of context, and these are material as well as monetary, which is something we're always grappling with as architects. Less than 10 years ago, the firm had just completed uh, a now well-known installation at PS1 for the Museum of Modern Art, which consisted of a series of misted uh, platforms and risers, uh, like the sculptor Kawamata, a frozen flow of wooden members, splinter-like, against the walls of the old school building courtyard in Long Island City. It gave a resonance and an unexpected shadowy beauty to the newly found Tar Beach. This is when we actually first met. Uh, this also garnered a remarkable amount of attention for a program which was very, very new at the Museum of Modern Art, by which they would use an outpost in Long Island City to begin to talk about space, architecture, at a scale which it really deserved and which was very, very difficult to pull off in its uh, older gallery space. This also garnered a good deal of attention for the firm. But this wasn't by any means their earliest work. Um, uh, a kind of larger project w was also a landscape. And this was completed just after starting their collaboration, or begun just after starting their collaboration in 1986. And this was for an urban redevelopment competition um, in Greenport, Long Island, for an area called Mitchell Park. And uh, Greenport, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is an urban center, sort of a way station on the way out to the palmier reaches of uh, the North Fork. So cheek by jowl with uh, Richard Serra and Lavender Farms and people with kind of uh, clever names for cheese stores. There's also Section 8 housing, uh, still the remnants of a, of a fishing industry and, uh, and the heavy, very typical accents of the shopkeepers, kind of Long Island uh, drawl, which is, uh, has its own special charm. Uh, on recent visits there, the project has, has held up, and it was really one of the first of a projects that now we might term landscape urbanism because it really sought to begin to weave multiple strands of activities within a phased project that included a carousel and a, um, uh, was it a, the, uh, uh, yeah, the, the camera obscure, which is a kind of wonderful um, uh, kind of anomaly to find on the waterfront. Uh, it also accommodates a yacht club and paths. And then this carousel, which is a kind of odd piece and the machine that they designed to house this carousel with kind of 
metal wings that open up and close to protect it from the weather still operate with industrial precision. And it's both public and private and an open-ended set of scenarios which actually enriches the experience of the waterfront. The scale of the work since 1986 or since the installation in PS1 has certainly increased. They're now doing development projects in the Hudson Yards and a large-scale waterfront redevelopment on the East River and uh, there's also a stadium in, uh, in their future in Brooklyn, uh, which is a very, very exciting project. Uh, so if I look back at this just very, very quick arc of a, uh, of a firm's profile, to have gone from young architects, both literally and in name, in uh, 2000, to emerging architects at the Architectural League in 2001, to a National Design Award at the Cooper Hewitt in 2009, this is actually fairly rapid pace. It's sort of like dog years or something for architects. It's, it's, it's quite remarkable. Uh, their book, uh, Out of Practice, will be published by Monticelli Press in 2010. So again, completing this series of achievements. Uh, in between, Greg has managed to also start a family and has taught at Yale and the University of Virginia, Columbia University. I'm also pleased that he'll be joining uh, Syracuse Architecture in New York and teaching our studio there in the spring. As a teacher, he draws from his own work in practice and early training in business and design, and his work is eminently teachable. And I'll just leave you with a, a final anecdote. If, um, if you had a quarter for each time I've used you as an example, about what architecture could be. When you have to talk to um, non-professional clients or to students or to administrators of large municipalities or universities, the ability to talk about architecture actually making sense qua architecture and actually coming in on budget or being innovative in its strategies is fantastic as an example. And so I think about um, Shop's Porterhouse building, which many of you know on 14th Street, and Ninth Avenue. And here, not only was the zinc cladding sourced in France, the sections were then cut directly through a computer program, an early uh, building to use this technology. And that kind of wonderful distinctive cantilever of the mass of the building was only achieved because uh, Greg was able to convince the development partners that this cantilever would actually generate more net saleable square footage, which allowed this to happen. So for me, it seemed um, a kind of uh, interesting mode of working, which recaptured uh, the power that architects can have, both in the public realm and in the market. This new hybridity is seen in the partnership of shop ar architects um, in G-Works with HRNA and Bureau Happold engineers. And this kind of engineering or agility in responding to the market in all conditions is really a hallmark of invention. To make it look easy is very hard. I'd like to welcome Greg Pascaron. Thank you, Mark, very, very much, and thank you to Gene Seligman for sponsoring the lecture and to everyone here at Syracuse. Oh, I have to turn this on, probably. Can you hear me now? Is it a Verizon commercial? Yeah. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> I, well, the first thing is the park was done in 1996 because in 1986 I was still in high school, but we'll let that okay. go. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, it, 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 it was a, it was, it has been, uh, the other thing that you said I think was very interesting is that it, it, it has been a kind of quick rise, but it does feel like dog years. Each year does feel like seven years. So even though it's been a decade, uh, uh, I do feel a little rusty still. Um, but anyway, uh, it's really nice to be here. And um, uh, Mark did such a great job of sort of trying to position what the office is about. And what I want to talk about tonight is how does a young practice, or what youngish is now they call us, um, has sort of what we did for a few key projects over a decade to change the way in which we practice. Um, and what were the sort of challenges that we were dealing with then and what are the challenges that we're dealing with now. 
and how we use architecture uh, not only as a design tool but as, as, as a kind of strategic tool and, and architectural thinking not only just purely as designers but, but uh, as, as people who try to uh, commit themselves to the production of culture. Um, SHOP is an acronym, or was an acronym actually, uh, uh, that originally stood for Sharpless, Holden, Pascarelli, uh, which were the three names of the founding partners. Uh, we've since taken our names off the firm because we don't believe it's about us. It's about this think tank. And uh, even though there are three last names, there are five partners. Um, so that's a little bit confusing uh, because the partnership is made up of two husbands and wives and the identical twin brother to one of the husbands. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, this is the year we graduated from Columbia. We all went to Columbia together. And if you're inside a green box, it means you're uh, married and share things like bank accounts. And if you're inside this blue bob, blob, you are identical twins and share things like genetic code. Um, and uh, the office is uh, about 65 architects now. And um, uh, one of the bit things that's really important about, about uh, the staff is that um, we try to get people from as many diverse backgrounds as possible. And you know, we have fashion designers and poets and attorneys and scientists on staff. And we think that's just as important as having architects on staff. And um, I think it's also important that the five of us actually had other careers before we went into architecture. And not that that's so important, except for us, I think it allowed us to freely adapt other methods of problem solving from other industries and try and bring them to architecture. Um, the firm has grown quite a bit, uh, although you know this is kind of a bummer uh, in the last 12 months. Uh, but fortunately in the last three months we're back up to here again. Things are going very well. You should all be very happy by the time you graduate. I think things will be good again. Um, but the firm has grown quite a bit. And I think that, um, uh, you know, the way that the five of us came together was out of a criticism of this division that occurred in our profession. And we didn't, when we were in school in the late uh, in the early 90s, you know, there was this kind of choice you had to make. You could either learn how to put a building together or you could think and teach and do really exciting work and there seemed to not be something in between. And to us that was not what we were interested in with building. And we were also not interested in being a member of the sort of battling isms, this kind of idea that a, a theory was put forward, an aesthetic was attached to it, it got a show at MoMA, a couple buildings got built, and then it was sort of discredited, and the next one came in. And we said, if we were going to do that, we'd rather be in fashion, and it would be kind of more fun, and you know, we could, it, would, it would be a, a different kind of life. But it wasn't what we were interested in. And the five of us came together not because we had an interest in, a like interest in aesthetics or design. It was a like interest in what we wanted to do and how we wanted to practice. And that the idea was to see if we could create a new kind of firm, what we call a both and firm. Um, that, that took on the seriousness of being able to detail buildings and build them and work in the public realm and work at very large scale. At the same time being highly interested in teaching theory concepts and, and you know, uh, sort of cutting edge work. So I think that early on, the way that we tried to attack it was this notion of performance-based architecture. This idea that the buildings would emerge, each building type by type would emerge as a response to what was happening on the site and that the client would have to go through a kind of process with us. Um, and, and that, that was, there wasn't a kind of easy way to try and identify what a shop project was. I think in the first year of the firm, we, we made a statement that if we were really successful and 30 years from now there were 20 shop buildings around the world in places, we'd be really happy if you couldn't pull up to it and identify it as a shop project. And that was really the way that we started to think about it. And I mean the automotive industry and the aerospace industry we felt were the two places where we really drew a lot of inspiration in this relationship between performance and design. Of course. You know, it exists in nature, it exists in many, many places. Um, and it even existed in architecture. Um, and the kind of notion of 
of uh, uh, emerging technologies, emerging materials, a history of art, a blending of, of form and performance. There's a long, long history of it. But one that I think had been um, sort of uh, ignored a little bit by the profession in, in, in the second half of the 20th century. Um, but you know, going back and, and, and starting to begin to use these emerging technologies, you know, sort of uh, digital digital design and the ability to make these complex shapes and the ability to have these complex shapes uh, uh, affect space, affect cities. Uh, you know, we were getting these forms, but of course, these are really expensive buildings to build. And here we were, a really young practice, and we were not going to get Frank Geary budgets, and we had to figure out how are we going to build these things. Uh, at very standard construction costs. So, you know, the thing that we realized was that, and very early, starting in 97, we were really, um, actually 96, we were really into uh, digital fabrication. Uh, we bought our first 3D printer in 98 for an office of six people. Um, and we really invested a tremendous amount of energy into that connection between, between design and making fabrication and assembly. Um, and the more that we got involved in, in, in doing these things and trying to explain, and building in New York where there's a limited amount of talent for, for, for building buildings, um, we realized that the drawings we were making, that, 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 that plan section and elevation were not sufficient enough tools to explain what we wanted to do. And it really started to become much more three-dimensional tools, tools that had time involved, tools that had, sequ uh, uh, drawings that had sequencing involved, and really began to explain how things got put together in a different way. And, and so for us, at the end of the day, it was never really about the shape or the form. It was about how it was made and what it did that, that mattered to us. And so whether that's um, looking, and, and, and yet the more we sort of got into that, the more we realized that we were kind of going back to the master builder and looking at that long history, and whether it's, it's the bricks from Brunelleschi's dome or, or three of the 4,200 pieces of zinc that it took to put the porterhouse together, um, we started realizing that the more and more we were willing to grab these territories that had been given up by architecture over time, the more control we had over our work and the, the, the more kinds of methods of practice that we were able to, to sort of attack and, and the more interest we had in what we were doing. So, um, you know, this is, I believe, the only drawing in the AIA documents. And we believe that this is the worst drawing made in the history of architecture. This is a drawing made by attorneys that want to ensure that they have work for the rest of their lives. Because it sets up a, an a animosity between the three key players who make buildings. And, and I think that our, you know, we didn't realize this when we started, but, you know, looking back a decade later, I think that the main thrust of our, of our office and our work has been an attack on this drawing and seeing what we could do to change it. So, you know, very early, it, it was this idea of bringing the consultants in almost before we were designing. And I'm not talking about the mechanical and the structural engineers. I'm talking about the consultants like down to the, the guys who work in the field. For example, if we wanted to work in metal, we got a tin knocker and we said, what are the six different ways you clip metal together? Uh, if we wanted to work in brick, how big are the pallets? How many could fit on a truck? If we wanted to work in concrete, we just began to ask all those questions and those things began to be the drivers um, uh, for the way that we were designing things. So as I said, I'll bring you through a few projects uh, that showed how we tried to sort of take incremental steps over a decade to begin to build a practice that now does uh, very different kinds of work. So Mark uh, spoke about PS1. Um, this was, we, we did it the year after Philip Johnson had done the um, installation in the courtyard at PS1. And it was a competition and they asked us to do an urban beach. So uh, this is actually the competition drawing that we submitted, which was, um, we said, do you need sand and water to have a beach? And we said that, in fact, you didn't. You just needed a, a place for shading, a place to change, a place to lie in the sun, a place to dance, and a place to get wet. And the idea was to take a series of surfaces and mutate those surfaces along their length, performatively, 
to allow every one of those programs to occur. So um, the other thing was this is the entrance to the courtyard and the entrance to the museum. So people walk through and up the steps and in the front door here. The other performative aspect of a beach is the notion of the promenade. The fact that you either sit on the beach and you watch everyone walk by or you go for a walk and you try and find your friends on the beach. And so the architecture was placed in such a way that the people who were going to PS1 were the people sitting on the beach and the sort of unsuspecting museum goers became the promenaders and set up this performative relationship as people were moving in and out of the museum. Now we had three weeks to design it and we had three weeks to build it and we had a total budget of $50,000 for 6,000 square feet of space. So we said it had to be simple and easy but yet could it make something complex at the end. So the idea was to just take two by two cedar sticks and set them up in a A, B, A, B relationship and model it. That was the first sketch on the left and then the first digital model we made. And uh, this is kind of a manual BIM, if you will. This is actually the, the model and the model that we used to build from. So the red is A and the blue is B and the purple is when they're overlapping each other. And we just controlled the splines. We connected the, the sticks to the splines. And by moving the splines, we were able to have every one of those programs embedded into the surfaces themselves. This is the construction, the full construction document set to build PS1. Um, and this is one drawing. So this was 32 feet long by 16, 15 feet high um, templates that were laid down on platforms and you just drop the, the sticks in color-coded sequences and every time they crossed each other you hit it with a stainless steel screw and you trimmed off both edges. And the Z coordinates uh, uh, were located with these numbers and here you can see it being put together. We, we built it ourselves um, and then we um, designed a, a forest of steel trees um, throughout the courtyard that had high, pr uh, high pressure mister heads on the top. And every 15 minutes they would blast and fill the entire courtyard with um, uh, the, the spray from the ocean. Um, and then the water was pumped up onto the roof and it came down in a waterfall and made these two pools. And um, uh, that's Dunescape as it looked when it was finished. So um, as we said, uh, our, our fee for that project was $12,000 all of which we gave to people who worked on it. And um, you know, the year before we did it, as we said, Philip Johnson had done the, um, uh, the installation. They got 2,000 people every weekend. Uh, here you could see the kind of smooth transition between uh, a bench and a wall. And um, uh, so there was 2,000. Then we got about 60-something articles written about this architecture when it came out, this piece. And the year that we did it, they averaged 8,000 people per weekend. And so we did a quick calculation of 6,000 extra people per weekend times 12 weekends in the summer times $10 admissions to the museum plus three beers and a hot dog. And we realized that we had generated a million dollars for the museum that summer and were paid $12,000. <laughs> and we said, something is wrong with architecture. So, but we, we tried. We'll talk about how we tried to change that over time. But here you could see uh, the sort of shading device going into a pool, the kind of walls, and uh, your sort of typical day, your typical day at Dunescape. It was, it was great. Uh, Alana Heiss, who was the head of PS1, was, was fa a fantastic client. She said, we want an architecture that will uh, encourage as much illicit behavior as possible. So we said, well, what do you mean by that? She said, well, I think people should smoke a lot and take off their clothes. <laughs> So we embedded ashtrays in all the walls. And actually, the thickness of the structure itself had hidden chambers inside that you could go in with your friend or friends. And you could hang out there all summer long. And um, no one could see you, but you could see everybody. And um, they were well used all summer long. And a lot of people took off their clothes. There's one of the chambers you could crawl inside. Um, and here you can see the changing areas. And they gave us the museum one night. We threw a party and just filled up all the pools with ice and, and bought, I think, 100 cases of beer and invited all our friends, which was really fun. But I think the interesting thing about that was that there was a moment that we, um, 
we decided, we, we, it, was a, it was a breakthrough moment for us because it was the first time this notion of thickness really came to, became clear to us, which was not a rejection of, but a clear departure from the modernist idea of separating the program, the structure, and the skin of the building to actually blending those things together. And that notion of thickness, that structure, program, and skin are blended into a single thickness is still a driving force behind our work today. So we, we uh, um, uh, Virgin saw the, uh, 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 the, the, the piece at PS1 and asked us to do the first class lounge out at JFK, so kind of using the same idea of a series of thickened screens that contain program, created a landscape, uh, there's a, a kind of river that we built with, with rocks and waterfalls that separated from the airport. And uh, here you can see the waterfall and the, and the stream. And, and this kind of um, uh, screen that was all fabricated by the computer. Um, and then it was all, here you can see the, the instruction drawings for, this was the first time we had to write our own script to nest materials. No one had really done that yet. It was all being done manually. Um, and then the way that it would be assembled and brought onto the site the embedding of the sort of HVAC and the, and the lighting and the colors and the digital equipment was all in the screens themselves. Um, it also helped us, this notion of thickness, on a project we did outside of Seoul um, in, in uh, the, 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 it's called Hangul Sa, which is a, a sort of a book house and cafe and lecture hall and bookstore. Um, has a sculpture garden, and again, making these kinds of drawings that were easy to understand, that could be built uh, by anyone, um, <clears throat> but also still making, you know, this, it has this three-story high bookstore that a series of ramps wrap around to get you from the up part, the, the higher part of the hill down to the lower part, and the building as it kind of glows as a lantern on the hillside at night. Um, you know, that the, they, they work, they're fabricated, they're really sensitive to material, but they're also, <laughs> you know, more performative uh, than aesthetic. Um, the second thing that we realized was we, we, the more we wanted to push what we were building, the more we had to get involved with the actual construction process itself. And so um, in Mitchell Park, the project um, that we spoke about earlier, um, there were several buildings. This was a, a, a state-funded project. This was the original site. It was four acres. There was a car the, the town had an antique carousel that it kept in this butler building here on the corner. They wanted to make it the centerpiece of the park. Uh, Mayor David Capel was really the, the, the vision behind this whole project. And it included a, um, a, a marina, a deep water ferry for high speed ferry service to New York, a ferry terminal, um, and then a water garden that changes to a skating rink in the, um, in the, the winter, an amphitheater for performances looking out towards the water, and then this sort of harbor walk that connects the whole uh, project. So uh, again, it took eight years to build, start to finish. We, we did everything from become the soil remediators to be out on site, to fabricating the pieces, to general contracting certain parts. Here's the carousel house that Mark talked about, where all the doors of the carousel house actually respond to the local climate on the site, the microclimate. So they shut down when there's prevailing winds. They open up when it's warm. Um, and again, this, the, they used to get about 1,000 rides a month at a dollar a ride in the Butler building. They average 40 to 50,000 rides a month uh, in the summer now, which allowed the mayor to hire two full-time caretakers to this village who have repaired all of the, um, the, the sidewalks, planted flowers, painted the whole town, and they've actually seen um, a greater uh, real estate appreciation than its neighboring towns as a percentage. It's not a coincidence that Mayor David Capel is also the town's biggest real estate broker and had the big vision for using design as a catalyst for economic prosperity. So here you could see the park at night uh, with the water garden. This is the, uh, the ferry terminal. And then in the winter, as it turns to a skating rink, and then uh, the last piece that we did on this project uh, was the camera obscura. And they wanted a folly in the park. They wanted a camera obscura. We said, OK, we'll do a camera obscura. And it was a small enough building. And this is like 2001, 2002 now. And 
and we really spent a lot of time using the digital, uh, the, you know, the sort of technology to help us both design and build. But we wanted to see if we could make a pure performance envelope building, meaning that it was absolutely driven purely by the scripts that were telling the building what it needed to do. And we wanted to see if a computer could absolutely make every single part that went into the building. So this was really a kind of watershed test case for us. So this was the sketch where we just talked about what it had to do. It gave a kind of minimum surface for allowing those things to occur. Here was the notion of the camera obscura where you could look around the whole park and it would project an image onto a table in the middle. And this is what we call BIM version 0.1 where we basically manually just built in the computer every single part that went into the building. There were, I think, 1,480 different parts. No two were alike. Um, and these are the, uh, the construction documents. So it was an index, a spatial index of every material type. So you saw where it went three-dimensionally. And these are the drawings. There were either drawings that told the computer how to make the parts or there were drawings that showed the fabricators how to take those parts and assemble them. And uh, it was about a 30-page set of drawings. And, um, you know, uh, fold, weld, bolt, screw. Those were the instructions on there. And um, the fascinating thing was when we finished the set of drawings and we sent it out to bid, it wasn't until that point that we looked at the drawing set and said, there are no dimension strings anywhere on the set because they're totally irrelevant. Every single part is made by the computer, arrives on site, fully cut, numbered, drilled, slotted, ready to be put together. And, um, and this was actually for the uh, triennial at the Cooper Hewitt a few years back. We just took the same model and printed it again, just at this scale instead of building scale. And those are all the parts that it takes to make the building and exactly what they looked like when they arrived on site. So it's like the most kick-ass piece of Ikea furniture you've ever seen in your life, basically. Um, so here are some of the drawings. I mean, here's some of the, the, the drawings and, and as it's being fabricated. Uh, we even made templates that had instructions on how to weld. Uh, the, the welding instructions were actually laser cut into the sill plates so that the, the guys wouldn't even have to look at the drawings. They could just pop them together and follow the numerical sequences. Uh, even, the, even the formwork for the foundation was all milled and they just had to, the surveyor just showed them four uh, spots on the site and then they full scale templated the foundations in and dug the hole and poured the concrete. And um, the building went together in six weeks um, with two guys building it, like a, like a kit. And the only time we had one of our shop guys out there full time, Mark Hours, and he said the only time there was ever a problem was one day he heard a jigsaw go on and he ran out of the trailer and just said don't cut anything and the guy had just picked the wrong piece up and was trying to make it fit in but we knew if, if he was cutting something there was it was a it was a mistake and the other thing that was fascinating was the contractors never wore tape measures on their belt because they were totally irrelevant so the thing about it is this really proved to us what you could do so again as a small project we used it as a kind of R&D piece but what was possible to do using the technology. Now, now that we're doing 40-story buildings and $600 million arenas and that kind of work, we would never suggest that you build a building of that scale like this. But what we do do is try and strategically take a couple parts of every building and use this thinking to, to really push the level of the whole building. And you'll see how that strategy um, unfolds in future projects. But here you can see Greenport as it was totally finished. Um, the next thing that we did was we realized that no, all this technology and all this kind of uh, design intelligence, although that's gotten a bad rap recently, but you know I still think it's design intelligence, was generating revenue for our clients. But we were still being paid by the hour as architects. And in any other business, that's not how it works. And so the point is that you need to take you need to see if there are ways that as architects and designers, if you're really creating something and giving something and making the buildings generate something, you've got to take equity positions in your projects. Now, of course, you can't do that on a museum uh, or a government courthouse, but, but certainly on some projects you can. And so we started to see, is it possible as architects that we could become partners with the developers? 
And the trade-off is we give you our design intelligence and we invest money in exchange for a percentage of the, of the profits or losses in the project. So the first time um, we did that was at a building called the Porter House. Um, so there was a six-story building in the um, meatpacking district. Uh, it was a warehouse, and there were a bunch of developers chasing that piece of property. We were one of them. We actually found the site. And um, the first idea was to buy the air rights from the two smaller historic buildings because it was built to its full FAR. So the, you know, and a lot of guys had that idea too. Let's buy the air rights. So we negotiated for the air rights with the neighboring buildings. But there is a height limit in the area, and there was a setback requirement. So the only way to make the building bigger, and therefore it would generate a little bit more sales revenue, and therefore it would allow us to bid a little bit more on the piece of property, would be to expand it by cantilevering. And a few other guys had that idea too. But the whole trick was how, could, how far could we push that cantilever before you start having a diminishing return for the cost of the, of the, the, the structural cost, the added structural cost. And so um, it, working with Bureau Happold and uh, Craig Schwitter, we really came up with a, an interesting strategy because it was an unreinforced masonry building. And what we did was we basically built a six-story new um, uh, steel and concrete building above and took a six-story um, uh, re unreinforced masonry building, which we had to reinforce. We moved the core to the center, and that became the kind of structural element that kept the building from rotating over. And we made a three-story truss where the two buildings linked to uh, inexpensively hold that cantilever and deliver the forces down into the, um, into the mini piles. So here is you, kind of, you can kind of see the, the diagram of where the air rights went to develop the porterhouse. So again, the massing is really a pure performance envelope. That's where it comes from. And then the idea was, all right, well, we're going to add something to this beautiful historic building. And we want to make it, uh, you know, we wanted to sort of say, what's a new idea about contextual, you know, a kind of contextualism. And our idea about contextualism is that it shouldn't look anything like the building that it sits next to at all. And so um, the idea was to make it a zinc building. And we, we went and talked to zinc fabricators, and it was outrageously expensive. And we couldn't understand why a zinc building would be so much more than a regular metal building or a stainless steel building. So we got on a plane and went to France where they make zinc and we bought a thousand sheets of zinc and we brought it back to the United States and we designed the whole building around how many, how efficiently we could lay out the, the unfolded panels of the zinc on the raw material which came in one meter by three meter sheets. So it was either one panel, two panels, four panels, et cetera, et cetera. And the main idea was that we would use you know, three panel shapes four window sizes and two lighting element sizes and blend those together into a kind of cloud around this new contemporary box that sits above. So here you can see the, the, the drawings of the, of the porterhouse and the, the zinc clad part above. Uh, this is a, a typical plan with the, the core in the middle that really is holding the whole structure of the building. And it was 22 um, uh, residences and a commercial space on the ground floor. And we didn't have the money to do this. So we went to one of our clients who we really liked, who was a brilliant progressive guy named Jeff Brown, Jeffrey M. Brown. He's a builder and developer from Philadelphia. And we joint ventured on the project. And the fascinating thing was that we went to... You know, we were a little nervous. You know, this is a kind of scary thing. And no, there was no model for doing this. And we were, you know, our colleagues, our fellow professors, you know, they, they all said, you know, you better watch out. You're getting in bed with the devil. This is the slippery slope. You know, you're going to sell out your whole career. I mean, you can't believe the things that were said to us. And it was actually Bernard Chumi who I went to and said, Bernard, am I, am I crazy to do this or, or should we not do it? And he, Bernard was the one who told us, he said, oh, you should absolutely do it. He goes, don't you know that Los developed a, his own stuff? And he started rolling through the history of architects that did this to help fund their, their, their you know, more creative work. But that wasn't what we were interested in. We weren't interested in sell-out projects that funded our, our museum work. We wanted to 
be that both and kind of firm. And we wanted to prove that it was possible to make design a profit center and not a cost center and do projects that we were really proud of. And so the, 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 as we got into the kind of uh, way that we wanted to build it, and we had these 4,200 pieces of zinc, it would be absolutely impossible to draw all these shop drawings. So it was the first time that we used SolidWorks, uh, where we had a kind of protoform of panel type, and all the differences were just loaded into the, the spreadsheets. And it went directly from spreadsheet to the laser cutters, which then had a coding system put on, which explained where the panel, when it was produced, where it was laid out on the site, when, it, when and where it went on the building. <coughs> and it became this kind of three-dimensional puzzle kit that went around to create the facade. So here you could see it as it was going up, and, and, um, and here it is as it was finished. And, you know, it was a big risk, and this was, we, we had put down the deposit in August of 2001, and 9-11 happened, and people thought everyone was going to run from the city, and it, I mean, it was, it was a pretty hairy uh, uh, exercise and, and took, you know, four years to, to complete from start to finish, but it was an amazing learning experience for us. Here you can see the building with the historic part below, the setback terrace on the seventh floor, and the cantilever from the front. Um, the apartment sold out in nine weeks, and we averaged more than 15% higher on our sales than the three other competitors in the neighborhood at the same exact time. And it proved the point to us that it, it is possible to do. Um, here you can see as the lights start to go on. I think one of the really nice qualities of this building was a lot of times metal buildings feel very thin when the glazing is put in the same plane as the, as the metal. And we really wanted to get shadow and thickness. And so all the, all the uh, windows are put back 14 inches. Of course, that causes a problem in New York because you're now creating ledges on every window. And we've got a, a pigeon issue in, in New York. So we actually called the um, Museum of Natural History and asked them if there was an angle of repose for a pigeon, meaning is there an angle that a pigeon won't land on? They said, oh, in fact, there is. It's 34 degrees. And so we um, actually, this is from the construction set. We put these little sloped uh, pigeon slides on the front of every single window. And in fact, we built the building. And I was standing there, and I saw a pigeon flew in, landed, and flew right off. <laughs> And six years later, there's not one turd on the entire building. <laughs> so um, we did the we we designed the interiors. We did the marketing materials, what are called the collateral materials. Um, that's the lobby, and we brought it to market and we sold it, and it was it was a success. And I think that it was a it was a success financially, but that really wasn't the thing that 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 got us so excited. What what happened there, which was such a seminal moment for us was the second we had equity, the second we were in the same boat with our client, they never questioned our design work again. It was no longer a battle for what we built. So in fact, where we were told by everyone that we were going to get in bed with the developer and it was going to be the slippery slope to mediocrity, in fact, by taking that risk, we got complete design freedom. And that was the key thing for us and why we continue to try and do it as much as we can today. The developer trusted us to make smart decisions for both of our benefits rather than only make decisions that were trying to get us on the cover of a magazine. And it, it, really, it really changed the way that we thought about stuff. Um, we, another project we're developing is on Houston Street. Um, so we, we bought these two buildings with a, a cardinal uh, real estate who are clients from uh, Los Angeles, right next to the Puck Building. Now this is in the last, um, this is in the last block in the Little Italy Historic District, and so the rules were that it had to be a masonry building. So we were like bricks. What the heck are we going to do with bricks? So we decided that let's push the idea of what a brick panel could be. So we wanted to do precast brick panels for the building, and the idea was, could we? use the computer to mill a custom formwork, drop the bricks in that formwork, pour the concrete behind, and lift it out with every kind of possible shape of the bricks on the front for a very cost-effective way. 
So this is some of the software that we worked on. Um, we studied, we were able to run about 60 or 70 different brick patterning overhang uh, panel types uh, very quickly and uh, figured out what the build, the building's uh, fenestration is basically a result of having the least number of eccentric panels produced to make the, the skin. And we developed this kind of really interesting feedback loop uh, for how we were testing, modeling, predicting the construction, and eventually designing what the building looked like. So again, it's, it's, it's pretty much a pure performance envelope. This was the first test of the, the CNC milled formwork and the resultant uh, brick piece that came out of it. Um, and then there are certain things in the New York City building code that allow you to put up to 15% of your building can extend over the property line. Um, in order, to, it was put in to make cornices and other kinds of architectural detail. But we were able to calculate basically to the brick exactly how much we were holding, we were hanging over the, the property line. And so you could see these kind of panels as they went out. What it eventually did was it allowed us to move the perimeter wall of the building six inches further out. And that six inches times the perimeter of the apartment times every floor generated enough revenue, additional revenue on the sales side that it paid for all the custom brickwork. So in fact, it was the same as doing a completely flat brick panel. Um, so here was the rendering. Here were the bricks, the panels as they came out of the yard, the first test one and going up on the building. And there you can see the facade today. And we think it's a pretty interesting counterpoint to the Puck building across the street. Now, this is a building that um, CIT is our primary lender, who you may have read recently is one of the biggest banks to go bankrupt. And so they stopped funding the project last November and we're in the middle of a, what's now almost a year battle with them to just, we're 85% done. They owe us $6 million to finish it and they don't have the money. So it's basically both of, we're just pointing at each other and we're battling to try and finish the building so that we can get people to move in. So this is the other side of the development game. But you know, even if we lose every single cent we made on the Porter House, it's a total win-win because we took the risk and we took the chance and we got these buildings built and we learned a tremendous amount about architecture, design, politics, and finance. And to us, that's what makes it really the most important thing. It's not about just financial gain at all. Um, so hopefully we'll get it finished soon. Um, there are other projects where the client just came to us as an advisor. Um, in Tulane, we won a competition to do an academic building uh, on the campus. Uh, again, it was this notion of blending three different programs together uh, and, and this whole sort of series of, of elements that sort of generate a cross-disciplinary pedagogy and the exchange of ideas uh, through these kind of screens that wrap through the academic programs. Uh, it, was a, it was a really beautiful building. Here you can see the, the model. Um, this is the out to the garden, uh, the view in the main lobby and what it would have looked like on the campus. So we um, signed the contract, I think it was August 25th, 2006, and August 28th, uh, Hurricane Katrina hit, um, and uh, we're still waiting to build the building as Tulane tries to recover from the issues that they're dealing with. But the interesting thing that came out of this was, um, this is Delille, Mississippi on day six after the storm. Um, the donor for the building, Martha Murphy, it was the Murphy Institute, called us. And she lived in Delille, and she said that her, all of her homes were wiped out. And she asked us to come down there. That's her home. That's her home. Here she is. And she asked us to come down. We got down there on day six. And she said, I've got to do something. I've lived here my whole life. I've got to do something to show people not to leave. Uh, uh, this is this town, Delille, Mississippi. It's about... 40 miles outside of New Orleans, right, on the, right near past Christiane uh, on the Gulf Coast. So um, actually, there's Chris Sharpless. He's not wearing a kimono, although we tell him that he always looks like he does. And, and one of our partners, and Craig Schwitter, who also came down from Bureau Happel. And we camped out, and we, um, Martha said, 
we got to build something. I own this piece of land at the corner of sort of front and main street, if you will, in the town, across from the school, which was the, this is five miles from the coast. That's the first building that survived. So from the coast, five miles in, every single building gone. That brick school was the first one. So she said, let's, let's build something that would, would get people to feel that something was happening. So we didn't know what the program was, but we said, let's just make two sheds, 10,000 square feet each, and we'll make a giant porch because it's so much about porch culture here and, and, an, and an entrance. And, it, and it'll be the sort of seeds of rebuilding the town. And who knows what will go in there, but people will definitely want it and use it. And the big radical idea for Mississippi was that um, they couldn't understand why we, we put the parking in the back. And because we felt it was really important as you were on the two main roads that you would see people on the porch and realize that everyone is still here. And they kept saying, but why would you put the parking in the back? We said, well, you want to see everyone on the front. And they, they were like, you guys are crazy. We don't understand that. But, um, and that's really kind of the front door brings you out and through. The first thing that went into this uh, 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 structure, well, well, the first thing was we had to build it where there were no contractors. And Martha said, don't make a depressing shed. We have enough FEMA junk all over. You've got to make something that's inspirational, but it had to be able to be built by very simple means. So we plasma cut these uh, plates uh, that went on these beams to make this kind of winged roof over the front porch as this kind of sculptural element that uh, became a shading device over the in front of the two sheds. Um, so those got sent down from New York. Um, these were the, the Navy Seabees who were walking around with the Red Cross not knowing what to do because they had no direction from the government. So they were hanging out there. So we found that the nearest place to get beer was about an hour and a half away. So we drove an hour and a half and loaded up a car with, with dozens and dozens of cases of beer. And we traded the Navy Seabees the beer for clearing five acres of land um, on the property. So they, they did it. <laughs> um, and, and it went together in seven months um, by just local guys because we took all the difficulty out of it by just having to follow those plates and screwing them together, it made that roof kind of come alive. So the building went together. Here you can see through. Actually, Parsons um, uh, with, with uh, um, Mark and, and Paul did, did this uh, building project out there. And uh, there's a laundromat. There's a cafe. There's a lawyer's office. Um, there's uh, a hair cutter. All these basic services that had nowhere to go. And laundromat being the key one because everyone's washers and dryers were, were washed away in the, in the storm. And um, uh, it was the first building rebuilt on the entire Gulf Coast. Um, and so it was amazing to use this kind of technology in a very different way uh, to, to sort of help this town. And it's, a, it's quite a huge success. On the East River Project, this is a... Um, whoops. Hello? Um, this is a project that we did, that we're doing for the city of New York. Um, and the idea is to uh, look at a two-mile stretch of waterfront uh, that's underneath the FDR Drive. And we sort of talked about it in connection with what's happening on Governor's Island and Brooklyn Bridge Park. And what you see here is the scale size of Central Park. So you realize that these are three huge parks surrounding uh, a harbor. Um, and the main idea here, which we explained to the Bloomberg administration, was not to make a big object along the edge, but to try and connect, the, make the cross-grain connections from the different neighborhoods out to the waterfront. So we did a whole series of program studies, and we ended up with a series of different projects that I'll show you. But the whole thing was about fixing the current conditions. You have infrastructure. Here you have under the FDR Drive. I mean, this is amazing. This is south-facing waterfront property less than half a mile from Wall Street. This should be the most valuable property in the entire city. But the city's using it for salt piles, parking. Uh, there was one part in the Lower East Side where we counted 14 layers of chain link fencing between where people lived and the waterfront, yet they have no parks, no open space. So we said it's really about, about trying to you know, break all that down. 
So um, we, we leased a helicopter, and we had them fly us around the edge condition of every borough in New York City and photographed it from the air and made a taxonomy of, of different kinds of waterfront types. And we found that there were a couple, only a few, where the buildings actually get really close to the river. And it was sort of the Brooklyn Promenade and the Upper East Side and the current Lower East Side down here. Here's our site. But the problem was that Water Street was the last street that's alive. And then you have Front Street and then you have South Street. And what we determined the biggest problem in this whole project was, was that the curb at the edge of South Street was sometimes 150 feet wide until you got to the other side of the curb. With no lane markings, there were, uh, you know, like we said, truck, truck and bus parking, and it's underneath this dark structure. So it was like taking your life in your hand to run a, in, in your hands to run across that and get out onto that that waterfront. So we said, look, all you have to do is get rid of the parking, add some planters and trees, get a get the bike lane in that circulate, you know, to make the whole uh, circumference of Manhattan. And instead of seeing the FDR Drive as this huge problem. See it as a free roof and fill it with lightweight structures underneath. That could be community uh, uh, program, cultural program, and recreational program. And bring the city out to the waterfront, but at the same time, shrink the width of South Street so it's now the same dimension as a normal New York City side street so pedestrians can cross easily. So that was basically the strategy. Here you see the pavilions underneath. And then for every square foot of dock that we can, or pier that we can reclaim, we should begin to build second levels that have recreation above and programmatic space underneath that could generate revenue to maintain the park. So um, here's the, the current uh, uh, design. You can see um, uh, one of the things we did was, uh, you know, uh, railings always have to be 42 inches high. And when you're sitting on a waterfront, that's always exactly where your eye level is and it blocks the view of the horizon. So we convinced the city that we would put bar seats along the entire uh, uh, waterfront with extra wide, 18 inch wide um, uh, handrails and electrical outlets and Wi-Fi through, through the whole handrail system. So you could sit there, you could flip open your laptop, you could read a paper, you could eat lunch, and you're sitting up high and you get to look out over the, the, the water. Uh, the planters are here. Here you can see the pavilions. And then this is Pier 15, um, which the, was a real battle. It took us four years to explain that by building this second level, it was like getting free open space or incrementally small additional cost, but free open space in, in, in Manhattan and how valuable that would be. So here's, a, here's the current idea of the pavilions, which take on the sort of tectonics of the FDR drive. And they said, well, who would ever want to be under, a, under the FDR drive? We said, lots of people would want to be under there. It would be really cool. Like, who knows who wants to be under there? <laughs> right? It would be great. And then we should make these things operable so all this program spills out onto the waterfront. And it makes, it's a different kind of park. We're not going to get a bucolic park here. We're not going to get hills and lots of trees. We have to make a park that's about the city. Um, this is the current design for Pier uh, 35 on the Lower East Side. We have a tidal eco park with a bridge coming across and a big screen wall that hides the sanitation department behind it um, and these different platforms. Um, wherever the historic slips were, we've tried to break down the seawall so you can actually get down to the water and touch it. And then this is Pier 15, uh, which has this kind of red undulating uh, belly underneath and these glass pavilions that puncture through into planters above. Um, here you can see a picture of the model. This creates an amphitheater on the second level of the pier that looks at the historic ships of the seaport and the entrance. And uh, this pier is under construction right now. So they're driving the piles and the park is being built and we got the Bloomberg administration to commit $150 million uh, to build this park. And it's underway. At the same time, we were asked by a private developer who own the South Street Seaport to re look at the seaport itself and what could be done here. So we said, look, this is the, the Roush Interior Shopping Mall on the waterfront. We said, you know, why don't you push the historic tin building, which was a waterfront building, put it back on the waterfront, open up the street grids, open up the views to the Brooklyn Bridge, 
let the esplanade pass through, and extend the grid of the city under the highway and make a new neighborhood with a four-acre open plaza midway out in the river. And this was the plan. I'll go through this quickly. Some of the first sketches we did. But again, this whole idea of, of putting the pavilions in, breaking them. Here you can see the pavilions to sort of mitigate the presence of the FDR drive. These were uh, uh, hotels that sat above. There were retail pavilions. Here you can see, so the retail is two levels here. The hotel floats above. And then we displaced all the FAR that would have been in the open space into a tower. Uh, here's the hotel. It's basically um, a garage door technology. Um, so everyone in bed gets an automatic garage door opener and can open the front facade of your hotel room. So every time you look at the, uh, the building, it's in a different configuration. And then the tower, the idea was how could we blur the density of the tower? We started to push the volumes back and forth. And then it was all suspended from an exoskeleton um, uh, on the outside, which was sort of taken from, from netting ideas with this slight change in geometry as it goes from the top to the bottom. The idea was this would be steel clad in terracotta. And there you see the, the different programs are kind of floating inside the exoskeleton. Here you can see the, the plaza, the retail, the hotels, and the tower. There are the cuts and the views in those streets to the Brooklyn Bridge. The building on the waterfront. This is as the esplanade comes up and through and what we hope it looks like someday. So we, we got about 90% through the approvals process on that, and then in September, our client, General Growth Properties, stock went from $66 a share, a $44 billion market cap company, to bankrupt and gone uh, in a matter of six weeks. So um, they are in restructuring. They're trying to get it out. This is one of the projects they are desperately trying to hold on to, and hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll get to do it someday. So last project, because I know everyone is, is tired. We're at an hour. Um, this is our building for FIT, the Fashion Institute of Technology. FIT is um, uh, you know, this sort of brutalist campus uh, in, in, in midtown Manhattan. And the performative idea on this project was, what is a design school really about? We said it's about exhibiting your work, reviewing or critiquing your work, and circulating your ideas. And so the, the campus has a sort of outdoor quad, uh, but, but it's, of course, not, it's not usable most of the times in the year, considering the climate in New York. So we proposed putting an interior quad on the fifth floor, because that's the floor that connects all the, the, all the buildings are connected by bridges on that floor. And the, the thickness of the facade itself ha is, has these three programs embedded in it all the exhibition space, all the critique and review rooms, and all the circulation of the building. And this was the competition model. Um, and it kind of, again, it's a very dumb, straightforward building in many ways. And then this front facade is made like the camera obscura and clipped on. Here you can see the, the section cut between the lobbies, the student life hall is the quad, faculty offices above, classrooms below. And this is the current design. This is the, the, the model at 100% DD. And what the building would look like on 28th Street. And so you know, it would be fantastic because you would, you would actually, it's north facing glass. So you would look in and you would, act, you would see the students doing the design. You would see them critiquing their work. You would see them uh, uh, you know, exhibiting and moving through the building like some really far out uh, ant farm. And of course, you know, in all the buildings, you know, we, we kind of believe in sustainability as a kind of holistic integral part of the building rather than sort of how much sustainable bling you can hang on the building, you know, with how many photovoltaics. It's really how does it work and that's a driver for the form itself. But here's a view looking into the quad. That's the, the view inside that space. And at night, you could look right down into the loom rooms and watch them making the fabrics. And, and then these end pieces are actually, the, we noticed that the students at FIT really smoke a lot. 
So um, it's it's unbelievable. So we um, instead of the, and they all crowd down at the bottom and block the entrance. So we made these giant tubes that are outdoor um, porches um, all over the facade. So you don't have to leave your floor. And we think it would just be amazing because between classes there should be just smoke pouring out of these things. <laughs> be kind of cool. So again, you know, there's this notion then about, about what if architects could just get rid of the client? What could we do? And, and it really came down to this, this diagram for us, which is what we call the cycle of mediocrity. It's, it's the fact that people are always making, people are always blaming this guy for being the bad guy. This guy isn't the bad guy. This guy is the bad guy, right? <laughs> And the reason is that they will not loan you, if you come up with a brilliant design and your developers behind it, they won't loan you the money unless you can show them the five other buildings that were designed exactly like this building and what did they sell for. And those are called the comps, the comparables. And what are the comparables of? They're what the product that was available to sell, which is what the brokers had to sell, which was the only choice the purchasers had, which drove the sales data that tells people in marketing uh, oh, people love granite countertops. You have to have granite countertops. I don't believe that everyone likes granite countertops. It's just that was the only choice in any high-end luxury product that they had to sell. And that tells the interior designers to put the crown moldings on, and that forces the architect into this terrible position. And so the whole thing is how do you rethink this relationship in order to make a change? And the problem is that architects don't want to take risk because the only way that you, ch and, the, and the AIA contracts are written to tell you not to take any risk. Don't, don't get involved in means and methods. Don't get involved in owning the property. You know, the, the, the insurance companies are like, if you're a part owner, you know, it's, it's, it's all written to keep you out of the game. And the whole thing is that we don't want to take risks. And it's not an accident that I've got the butterfly flying around the monkey's ass right here, because <laughs> that's exactly how we behave as a profession, all too much. And the fact of the matter is, in the United States of America, unless you take risk, you will never have reward. So when we complain as a profession that we don't get paid enough for everything that we do, it's because we're unwilling to take risk. But at the same time, the intellectual contribution that we give on the site is absolutely the most. There's no question about it. And I'm the guy that went to business school and worked on Wall Street as an investment banker. And I'm going to tell you it is way harder to be an architect than it is to be an investment banker. And architecture school is much harder than business school. Business school is about 60 vocabulary words and learning how to use Excel really, really well. <laughs> OK? But. In, in, in academia and the way the NAB is written and talks about it, they don't want us to get involved in it. Well, you know what? You have to engage it. You have to engage the financial model, you have to engage the political model, and you have to engage the construction model if you ever want to break the cycle of mediocrity. And so that's what we call double down. You've got to be able to get dirty, but still push culture as your main idea, but take risk. And if you're willing to do that, you can make a difference and you can change it. And so we're not saying that we're getting rid of the client in every one of our projects. That's not possible, right? But the point is, the architecture firm of the future needs to be nimble and needs to change the way that they work, depending on the situation and, and what's happening and the kind of project and the kinds of things that they want to do. But what we do is so much more complicated than what any other player does out there and, and we're the ones who actually know the most about each one. And that's why they keep trying to push us into a box, because they're afraid of us, I'm telling you. And, and yet, you can go out there and just don't think about what that building looks like, and don't think about the elevation, and don't think about the wrapper and the aesthetics and getting in a magazine. Think about how it engages on every single part. What does it do in the city? How is it made? What are the materials? And how is it going to last? And we always say this, the most sustainable thing you can do in a building is not hang photovoltaics on it. The most sustainable thing you can do as an architect is build buildings that people love and take care of so they don't get knocked down every 20 years and rebuilt and that kind of thing. And the way to do that is to engage all of these things at once. So SHOP has done real estate. These are all buildings we've invested in. 
at the end of this run, we probably broke even. We, we made some on some, we lost some on the others, didn't matter. We got to do them. We've gone into shop construction, which is helping with all BIM services and advising and helping our clients build. And now on our newest, largest projects, they're actually create, the builders are creating joint ventures with shop to help them build the projects. Shop applications, we've started a software company. Our first product is coming out in about six months. It's in beta testing right now. I guarantee you will all use it. It's something that every architect, it takes three hours for them to do and we've re reduced it to two minutes. And, and this is what we use in the office. That's our, that's our software map. Green is shop architects, purple is shop construction, and we're making a new product down here. And then G-Works, uh, which is a, 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 a group that's together to try and uh, help people take their existing building stock and turn it green. And Helioptics, uh, which is this uh, dynamic curtain wall technology that was developed by Anna Dyson at RPI um, and was going to go on our new building for Google. We're building Google's world headquarters in, in Mountain View, California. Um, but actually, the first place it's good, because that project was delayed a little bit, the first place this is good, the test bed is going in is right here in Syracuse in Toshiko Mori's new building downtown. And you will be able to see this working. It's a dynamic curtain wall that tracks the sun and gets about three times the amount of energy that a regular photovoltaic wall does, and you can see through it. Um, and and it's, it's getting, it's being broad, it's attacking it, it's not being afraid, and it's taking risk and learning how to build. And I think that it's, it's taking that kind of practice. And I'm not calling for a new style or a new period or a new ism, but it is an amazing time to be a young architect because the technology shifts are paradigm shifts. And they are allowing all of you this chance to go out there and chase down $650 million projects if you're willing to get dirty and learn how it gets done. And this is our new arena for the Brooklyn Nets, or our building for Google, or hopefully we'll get that tower back on the front, uh, no, on the waterfront at the South Street Seaport. Thank you very much. So, um, Greg, it, it's, it's interesting because you were talking about, uh, you know, do this not because you want to get on the magazine covers, but in fact, you've managed to get on the magazine covers, which is, which is great. Uh, just as an aside, really wonderful presentation. Really, the work and the direction of the work is, uh, I think, a great signal for us as architects and also in, uh, especially in a school of architecture. Um, but I, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the focus on landscape and the impact that landscape um, from that very, very early project in Greenport to the PS1, how that kind of consciousness of waterfront and um, landscape has kind of changed and sort of affected the way you think about making architecture in place. Um, well, I mean, we've been very lucky enough to work with Jim Corner. Um, on several projects. We've worked with Ken Smith on several projects. We've worked with Quinnell Rothschild. And, um, you know, I, I think design is design. And whether you're a landscape designer, an interior designer, an architecture designer, a product designer, uh, a software designer, it's about problem solving. And um, what I find really interesting, I think what we learned early on from the landscape projects um, was that surface has, uh, uh, it, it can't be about the rigidity of the formal composition. That we learned by doing a lot in landscape that it has to have a certain fluidity. 
And what matters is the kind of relationships and how they work between each other, not necessarily proportion or shape, if that makes any sense. So we, for example, in, in, in Greenport, the original design had the carousel house in the middle of the park. And it had this whole series of relationships between the other programs. And on the first meeting with the town, they said, you know, we feel we don't want the carousel in the middle. We want it to the side because we feel it's important that there's this view from the center of the town out to the water. It's a fishing village. And instead of saying, um, as some other people did, no, I won the competition and it had it in the middle and that's only the only way it's going to be because I believe in this compositional arrangement, we said, well, if we move it, everything else will move as well because it's about the relationships between the parts and manipulating the landscape to accommodate that. And is that a, does that work for you? And then they said, yeah, sure, that totally works. So, so it was about the relationships that we learned in designing landscape that gave a certain flexibility to the design that I think has served us really well as we move forward. So when we, when we did this arena, you know, there were other shapes, but, you know, it was, well, the NBA needs this, and the towers that are going after this need that, and the transit hub needs that. And instead of saying, well, it's a perfect form, it was all built parametrically, and it had certain relationships and rules, and we could pull and push and twist and drop it, and the integrity of the building was in place, uh, but yet it had a certain flexibility. And I think that's very important in, in work. If you're stuck with that rigid kind of compositional elevation, I think, I think you're in trouble. Um, it seems that most of the projects in New York, especially the high rises, are predefined by code and finance. And really, most of the attention goes to the detail of the facade. And I was just wondering what priorities go into the initial mass of the building, specifically in New York, and if there's a way to bend the rules, or do you just kind of not admit defeat, but abide by the rules and just pay attention to the facade. Um, you know, it's a very good point. Uh, I mean, without going into a whole history of planning uh, zoning regulations, um, you know, the '61 code, which was all made, which was rewritten from the '16 code, which was about the wedding cake skyscraper to the the plaza and the international style building, um, gave what I call zoning spread meaning there was a possible zoning envelope and there was X amount of FAR that went inside it. And there was a spread between that envelope and how much FAR there is. In the 1980s, something called contextual zoning came into play. And basically what the city of New York decided was they didn't want any more wild looking buildings. They wanted everything to fit in. They wanted everything to have a street wall and they wanted everything to have a setback. And they basically tightened the envelope down so much that the difference between the FAR and what you can actually build is almost negligible. There's almost nothing left. And, and the point of that was we would rather, and basically what they're saying to our profession is, we would rather have 500 mediocre buildings that fit in than risk having an ugly one and a great one. And that's something that we really have to fight against as a profession. And I have this conversation with, with Commissioner Burden all the time. And uh, I haven't convinced her yet, but I'm trying. But, but there's, a, there's a problem. It's that you're kind of stuck with that zoning envelope. And the cost of that FAR is so much that it's really, really hard for uh, the developers to, to forego it in exchange for greater freedom on the massing of the buildings. Now, on institutional projects like FIT, that totally doesn't conform to any of the zoning code at all. And we had to go for all special permits, but because it was such a clear argument in what the building did for the neighborhood, and we got the community on our side, we were able to, in fact, re rewrite all the rules there. This one, okay. Great lecture. Thank you very much. Another landscape question. Um, <laughs> the projects that you showed that you partnered with developers seem to be buildings, right? Seem to be object buildings. And I'm wondering if you see a future um, because there you can do the comps, you can do the pro formas, et cetera. I'm wondering if you see the future in your work, given that you're do, doing the kind of project Mark just talked about, where you'll be able to partner in urban landscapes and not just urban buildings. Well, I mean, I might argue that we partnered with the city of New York to do the East River waterfront. But, but you didn't take the risk that you took with the No, 
Well, in order to take the risk, there has to be a reward on the other side. And I think that, um, you know, par I believe parks should be free. So it's a little bit trickier. But if, if for example, uh, there was a point where the city wanted to cut the pavilions. And in fact, there were supposed to be 12 up and down the East River. And they still don't believe us that they're going to, that, that people are going to want them. And so I actually went to the city and said, I'll build them. I'll build them for you. I'll get the financing. I will build them. But then I own them. Or I lease them from you at $5 a square foot for 25 years. And let me take on the risk. And then they, oh, no, 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 we don't want to do that. So they, we, the compromise is we're getting to build two, actually three, and they're not going to let us build any more until they see if they're actually used. But, you know, when they were going to cut that out of our project, we believed in what we were doing so much that we said we'd be willing to take on the risk and do it. So I, I guess that would be the closest we've ever gotten to it, um, but they, they, they didn't let us do that, although I think it would have been great. Could you imagine having your office in one of those? It would be really fun. Anyway. Um, do you see opportunities in designing for disassembly? That's a really good point. I think there should be because, I mean, materials are just, raw materials are just getting more and more precious. And I think that you could almost see that as a kind of extension of what I was saying about the most sustainable thing you could do is build buildings that people love. But at some point, they're going to be obsolete. So if there is an ability to disassemble buildings, I think it makes a lot of sense and should be something that look, that's looked at more. Um, but uh, uh, that's not something we've gotten a chance to do yet. Hello. Um, in your uh, projects, such as um, FIT, there uh, seems to be a, a, a focus on the, the people and allowing for their activities and exposing them. Um, and it also seems that within the representation of your architecture, um, it would be a not an accurate uh, representation of it without the people. So what I was wondering was, um, to what extent um, is the like manipulation of people um, actually thought of as part of your architectural um, expression? What? What? It, I'm sorry. The last thing. What was the the something of the people? The what? The movement of the people? The the, the movement. The uh, the manipulation. Oh, uh, a huge. A, that's a huge part of the driver. How are people going to walk through this space? What are they going to do? How is it going to affect them? What are What are they going to see? What are they going to love? What are they going to touch? I mean, that's a that's a huge part of how we generate the design. I mean, those are the first gesture sketches on every one of those buildings are circulation patterns. Um, as far as rent, the rendering techniques and not having them in there, I mean, sometimes they're in there, but I mean, I, I always kind of feel like a little cheesy sort of putting the wallpaper people in, um, you know, scanning them and dropping them in, although they look good. But, uh, uh, you know, we haven't gotten that much built yet. Um, so at least when we had, when I showed uh, Greenport and PS1 and the early projects, there, there are people in them. and. I hope, uh, you know, for tip-off of the 2012-13 net season, there'll be 17,000 people right around that building, and we'll see how they, we'll see how they do. But we got, we got to get a few more built first. Thank you. Okay, one last, uh, one last question. Um, in terms of your, like, your firm structure, in terms of your firm structure, um, are the, is the risk taken on only by the partners? Or do the, like, does the entire firm kind of democratically decide that sort of thing? Um, the, the, that's a very good question. The risk has traditionally been taken on by the partners, um, although there have been other projects that we've done, uh, most notably Mulberry Street, where anyone in the office could invest as little as $1,000 and be a part owner of that building. Um, and we had of the, at the time we had, I don't know, 45 or 50 s staff, and probably 30 of them invested uh, in the building, anywhere you know from $1,000 on up. Um, so, uh, you know, I think uh, I think that's something that we would love to to expand over time. But you know, also right now, I don't know how many developer buildings are going to be going up in the next five years. So that's not going to be a, a main focus of our office. You know, development work was never more than 20, 25 percent of the the firm's. Uh, work, but it, but it's. I just thought it was a kind of interesting model, and why it's something that I've tried to share with everyone today. 
anymore.